Chris, did you feel podcasting history surrounding you on Monday? The weight of podcasting history boiled down on my shoulders. Because it was the 700th daily episode of Newscast on BBC Sounds. We marked that on Monday and we're going to mark it tonight here with one of our oldest friends, Dr. Katja Adler, who's in Brussels. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good Abend. Bonsoir. And happy 700th daily newscast <laughs> episode. <laughs> yes, our septennial. That I think rolled off the tongue really yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> like all the best brothers. Oh, happy 53rd birthday or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for being part of the journey. And of course, the journey started even more episodes ago than that with Brexit cast when we were all talking about the Brexit negotiations. That's right. That's right. And part I of our... I won't mention Switzerland tonight, but there you go. Well, actually, we might get your thoughts on that a little bit later. Uh, but of course, back in those days, we were never short of a cake. So we've managed to get a cake to celebrate the 700 and what, 704th episode no. tonight. Ooh. The bad news is it does not have any eggs in it because there's a massive egg shortage at the moment. Combination of the supermarkets and the farmers not getting on and avian flu. What so does it have in it? Cake. It's sort of very red with then sort of white globules of something gooey in the middle and then on the top. But yeah. Anyway, we'll see how long that cake remains you uneaten. You go into advertising, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So appetising. Um, we will see how long that cake yeah. remains uneaten in this episode of Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Hello, it's Adam in the studio. And it's Chris in the studio. And it's Cat here in the studio, but the Brussels one. And that cake is still winking at me. Um, yeah. Also coming into the studio to look at it and probably not eat it is going to be Labour MP and former Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott. And joining us uh, down the line is going to be the Scottish Conservative leader, Douglas Ross, who will be talking about that big judgment at the Supreme Court earlier this week. But first of all, today's kind of big news story politically, Chris, was the, the migration figures. Yeah. And so... This is the Office of National Statistics. They've got a new way of measuring it, so it shouldn't maybe totally compare it with old numbers. But they found there was 1.1 million people moved into the UK in the last year. And if you subtract the number of people that left the UK, that leaves you the net migration figure of 504,000. Yeah, huge number. A bigger number than we've seen ever before. It's only 200-ish thousand, isn't it? Yeah, and yes, there are factors that might mean that this is a blip. Uh, because of the war in Ukraine and because of those who've come from Hong Kong uh, and indeed from Afghanistan. But nonetheless, the number is, by any comparison, huge. And it happens just as we've seen Rishi Sunak saying he wants to see immigration fall. That's been a Conservative promise for a very long time, even though it's often been doing the opposite or the numbers have remained high. And you had Keir Starmer the other day at the CBI business leaders conference in Birmingham saying that there was an immigration dependency. Now, I asked him, actually, I interviewed him and tried to get him to say, do you want to see it fall? And he said, oh, I'm not getting into numbers. I said, I'm not asking about numbers. I'm saying, do you want to see it fall? And we had a bit it's of a, all about skills. All about skills a, a bit of a dance numbers. around all of that. But the clear thrust of what he was saying was a desire to address the concern of some that the numbers are too high. Then you see this number at 500,000. And... It's a bit of a head spinner, isn't it? Because on the one hand, it's kind of flattering to the UK that we are this magnet that lots of people are drawn towards. There are those who say you need immigration to help drive economic growth. And yet you've got political leaders saying one thing, the observable reality being the other. Challenges around public services as the population swells, school places, getting a doctor's appointment, ambulance waiting, all that kind of uh, stuff. So it's really hard. And what happens to those people who voted leave back in the Brexit referendum because they wanted to see immigration fall. Mm. Now looking at these numbers, how do they respond? Where do they go? Mm. What is the political consequence of it? And of course, just worth remembering, these are all people that got visas granted to them, either because they were joining family members here who were here already, their employers were entitled to bring mm -hmm. them in to do a job in the UK, or they were through a government scheme like the, the, the Ukraine or Hong Kong or um, Afghanistan, yeah. um, or lots of students coming in and spending lots so, and lots of money so with British crucially, universities. Crucially, they and, are... and, the, and the people coming over on the small boats in the channel illegally as the government would say it is a tiny 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 number tiny tiny number so the the, the 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 number that we're looking at are people who are legally here and ultimately that the government chose to allow to come it was a political decision that allowed that to to happen now catcher there's been talk in conservative circles about a sort of upgraded version of the brexit deal that might look a little bit more like the many deals that switzerland has with the eu which includes 
free movement of people, so uh, unlimited migration, although it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, I mean, those reports have been roundly denied by government figures, but um, what's your take on, on that conversation and what's Brussels' take on the fact that that conversation seems to be happening? What is the Swiss-style deal? Basically, it's Switzerland saying, we don't want to be a member of the European Union, but we want to have a closer relationship where it suits us. And then Brussels says, well, it's got to suit us as well. And that's how Switzerland ended up with freedom of movement as part of the package, even though it absolutely didn't want it, has tried to stop it. And it's been quite a tense relationship. And Brussels has been trying to pull Switzerland into its closer orbit since. Now, it's not as easy as some paint, because do you remember this? Well, you're having cake today. You can't mm. have your cake and eat it so you can't have a relationship with the eu no, and it is frictionless <laughs> and, and and not be in uh part of the single market and the customs union. But it was always sort of expected um, amongst many British diplomats as well that over time, when the word Brexit had stopped being so politically explosive, that it might be logical um, on the UK side as well as the EU to explore some of those avenues where you could get rid of some of the friction without having, you know, a political dynamite, if you like. The EU would always like to have a closer relationship with the UK that's in its own advantage, um, but it can't only be one-sided. You can't have that cake and eat it scenario. Um, and so at the moment, they're just sort of arms folded and kind of waiting to see, I would say. And Katja, stay with us because you're going to be talking about some actual explosions which you've been covering at the bottom of the sea later on in this episode of Newscast. Now, making her triumphant return to Thursday night, late night political telly. It gives me great pleasure to say, and I've always wanted to say this, it's Diane Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Diane. That was not a very good Andrew Neil impression. I thought it was quite good. <laughs> wow. it wasn't bad. I sort of imagine that you and Michael and Andrew just meet on a Thursday night anyway for a drink and a pizza and a <laughs> ch chin wag anyway. No, not quite. I mean, because it, it's been a couple of years, but mm. we did do it for seven years solidly. Yeah. Extraordinary. When I was first asked to do it, I thought, Andrew Neil and Michael Portillo. At midnight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 11.45. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> But it did work out. It did work. Right, there's loads of things we can ask you about because there's, there's loads of areas that you, you've got experience and expertise on. But just first of all, um, one of the big news stories today is about the net migration figures, yeah. 504,000. And just as by coincidence, your party leader did a speech about immigration this week. How do you think Keir Starmer's speech about, oh, the country can't rely on lots of immigration anymore, and then those numbers, what happens when you put those two things together? Well, I think the problem with those numbers, I mean, they're, you know, largely due to what's happening in Ukraine and Afghanistan and general instability in the world. But they are going to upset people who don't like immigration in principle, um, which in a way is good for Keir Starmer because that's what the speech was about. It wasn't about low wages, because if you're really concerned about low wages, you put up the national minimum wage. It's simple. You put up the national minimum wage and you enforce it even for people who are casually employed. It was it was really a speech addressed to people who, how can I put it, are not wholly favourable to immigration. But with these very high figures, you know, timing is everything in politics. Would you say Keir Starmer was blowing what they call in the trade the dog whistle? So yeah. When you make, you make a sort of a statement that is designed to appeal to a certain kind of person by using a certain language. Yeah, it was dog whistle politics, right. yeah. And I, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, he's 20 points ahead in the polls. I suppose he can do what he likes. But what I thought was what what I thought was remarkable was that he's almost been boasting about how our immigration policy is the same as the Tories. I mean, he sounded a bit like Suella Braverman in that CBI speech. You know, we can't have more immigrants. We have to, you know, employ local people and train them up. Immigration dependency, as he described. It. Yeah, that was a phrase. And I, I think the way it was spun was to give a, a very deliberate impression. So it sounds like Suella Braverman. The only thing where Suella Braverman is different is the Rwanda scheme, but that's not going to work anyway. Right, let's have a little listen to Keir Starmer so people can make up their own minds about, about how they interpret his message. So this was his speech to the Confederation of British Industry at the Employers Conference. Chris Mason was sat there in the audience, they'd interviewed him afterwards. And this was on Tuesday. Our common goal must be to help the British economy off its immigration dependency. The days when low pay and cheap labour are part of the British way on growth must end. Um, you were talking about the, about the figures, how a lot of them are people from Ukraine and people are from Hong Kong, the British nationals yeah. overseas, and, yeah, and, and various other kind of trouble spots mm -hmm. in the world. Do you think 
the conversely, Britain's generosity then actually will make it harder to bring people in in the future because people will just see this number and think it's too big, irrespective of where the people have come from. Well, when it comes for, to people seeking asylum, it's not about people being generous. I mean, international, you know, rules and treaties apply. You just can't turn away um, Ukrainians seeking asylum because Daily Mail readers get upset. I mean, that's not how it works. Um, are there other aspects of Keir Starmer's kind of growing policy platform that you're unhappy with? Well, like I say, he's 20 points ahead in the poll, so I can't say anything. But what I <laughs> no, what I would say is that he's been very resolute in refusing to back any of the groups of workers on strike. Absolutely resolute. I mean, his argument is, oh, you know, we're going to be in government and we can't take sides. But back in the day, you know, ministers and Labour governments did go on picket lines. And uh, I know John Prescott went on picket lines. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no law says that the Labour Party, even in government, can't go on picket lines. Um, but if, if being seen to be tough on immigration, if being seen to not stand on picket lines helps contribute to Labour having a, a big opinion poll lead, and who knows the extent to which those two things are factors, is it worthwhile if it makes, from your perspective, a Labour government more likely, even if aspects of that Labour government are not exactly how you would like to see well, it? Well, of course, if he's 20 points ahead in the polls, you can't criticise, really. But on immigration... The only thing I would say is that there are people, there are voters that would like to see an immigration policy based on facts because the Daily Mail and Swella Braverman would tell you are being overrun. We're not being overrun. We actually take fewer asylum seekers per head than Germany but, and France. There's a separate. There's the question, isn't there, around around asylum, and yeah. there's a question around uh, small boat crossings, and then there's the question around you know, the numbers we're looking at today. Yeah. Half a million net migration with all of the questions that poses around school places, around the NHS, around housing. You don't have to be, do you, someone who is hostile towards foreigners, for instance, to, to look at numbers on that scale and ask pretty profound questions about how a country deals with that yeah, well, and, and how, provides the necessary public services, for instance. How do you think instance? the country should deal with it? it? Bear in mind, we have obligations when it comes to Ukraine and, and Afghanistan. Tell me how we should deal with it. it, it it's not for, <laughs> The joy of being the journalist is asking questions rather than answering them. And I, I'm, just, I'm, try, try, I'm trying to get to the sense of, is it not reasonable for people listening or watching our conversation right now to just ask the question about the extent to which the UK can cope with an ongoing amount of immigration where you have hundreds of thousands of additional people arriving every year. Uh, bear in mind, this is a Tory government. We're not... The government isn't accepting these people at will. The government is accepting these people because it's obliged to. Whether it's the people of Hong Kong, to whom this government made promises, whether it's Ukraine, which is in the middle of a terrible war, whether it's Afghanistan, where we were involved in instability... This is not. This is not. There's um, also international students. There's also those who are brought in for the NHS, and plenty will make. Will say they make a vital contribution. They can contribute towards economic growth. But it, this is a tricky balance, let, isn't it? Let me assure you, this government isn't accepting migrants and asylum seekers for fun. They have come in. They have been allowed to enter the country because the government is obliged to do so. The only um, area where you could possibly cut it down is with international students. Uh, the difficulty with that, though, is a lot of our universities, they balance their books with international students. But, you know, let's not get into that sort of Nigel Farage type debate. The government is accepting these people because actually it has to. Um, now, uh, there was new research out this week about how much abuse MPs get on social media. And I was just thinking back to that research from one of the elections, you've, you've fought a lot of them, that found that something like 45% of the, the hateful tweets were actually aimed directly at you, which yeah. is just still an astonishing stat. How, how is that going now? Do you still get that, that ton of abuse? Or We still get a ton of abuse, but um, I tend not to read a lot of it. 
So on Twitter, I don't look at the comments on Twitter. Mm. I mean, it would be bad for my mental health if I did. And apart from that, I don't, I don't do Facebook anyway. I don't look at my own correspondence. My staff go through that. So my staff would say it's as bad because it's a mix, isn't it? It's people that don't like women and women get more abuse than men. And it's people that don't like black people. There's a lot of those people out there. Um, so, yeah, as far it's, as I know, it's, it's the same. And it's, I mean, it's d depressing, isn't it, in that you're a, yeah, factually a pioneering MP, the first black woman MP. You've been in Parliament for decades. You and, and yet and yet, despite all of that and all the different posts you've held within the Labour Party, this sort of torrent of horribleness. Yeah. Is it? And, and to such an extent that the only way you can cope with it is by not even going anywhere yeah. near it. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about the sort of misogyny element, the, the, the racial element. How, I mean, it's, it's horrible, whatever's motivating people to write horrible stuff. But it, it, how does that break down? Is it, is it, does it lean more heavily racial or lean more heavily misogynistic? Or I think it leans more heavily racial. And there's something that upsets people about a black woman who is confident and is out there, you know. Um, I think it leans more heavily racial, but there is that misogynistic aspect, there's no question. And some of it um, is sexualised because you're a woman politician. And, you know, with um, the stabbing of David... Amos. Mm. Um, we, my staff were telling me, because I don't see this stuff, we had this man who was sending us horrible, you know, um, correspondence, the usual staff, but he was fixated on David Amos, fixated. And my, they've only told me this recently, he was fixated, and they started to worry. And when they looked into it, they found, well, they worried because he was, he was telling them when I got my cab to go to Westminster in the morning. And right. so it's completely... Basically, big... you had a stalker almost. Well, he lived five minutes away from me. Right. So in the end, my staff got him sectioned. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think actually all LP MPs feel a little bit vulnerable mm. after mm. what's happened. But when you get this sort of mass of, uh, you know, online staff and written letters and so on with the, the threat um, behind it, like my staff insist on me uh, taking taxis to and from Westminster. They just, they just don't want me on public transport. That's not so there's no more pictures of you with a gin and a tin. On the, on <laughs> that, the that, that as well. But no, <laughs> they, they think it's and, not safe for me, to, for me to be on public transport. And how does, and, um, how can or should or does this change? Because this is about societal change, isn't it? And, it, and uh, many people will say that over the last generation there have been Big improvements as far as the, the whole questions around gender and race are concerned. Also, so, and so, so, yet... Also, just, sorry, just to interrupt on what you were saying. So, so do you not get any public transport at all now? I do. Right. But that, if it was down to my staff, I wouldn't get any. Right. <laughs> but I, I do come into Westminster and go home in a cab. But over weekends, when I'm in Hackney, I can't resist getting on a bus because mm. I don't drive and I've always used public transport. But, but if you're doing MP's business, you yeah. get a taxi because you don't feel safe. Yeah. My, well, my staff don't don't think I'm safe. Um, and they do get a bit of finger wagging when they hear I've been on a bus in mm -hmm. Hackney over weekend. Right. Um, how does it, you know, how does it change? I remember when it did change. You know, when I first became an MP, if you wanted to send abuse to an MP, you had to write a letter, you mm. had to put it in an envelope, you had put a stamp on it, then you had to walk out and put it in a post box. And you... Excellent mime skills there, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... For people who don't know how to send letters. <laughs> and, um... For the non-sticky stamps. You know, the ones yeah, that yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And um, you had to worry that possibly, could you actually physically send a letter, people could trace who you are. Mm. But when online became a thing, what you do is press a button. And you can abuse not just one MP, but a whole load of MPs. Does any of that make you think, you know what, I've done enough now? No, no, no. Because that way you'd be giving in to the racists, wouldn't you? Mm. And you yeah. were just saying you've been reselected. So you're, you, you're, you're running again. Yes, I'm running again. Yeah. Um, no, you, you can't let, can't let racists get you down because that's what they want to do. They want to drive you out of public life. No, no. Diane Abbott, lovely to have you back on Thursday Night Television. Thank you. There was an important ruling at the Supreme Court about whether the Scottish government has the power to call an advisory referendum on Scottish independence mm. next year. And there's quite a simple answer. 
no. Yeah. Um, and you can hear all about the background and the implications of that on Wednesday's episode of Newscast, which is available on BBC Sounds, of course. And we can talk about it a bit more now with Douglas Ross, who's the leader of the Conservative Party in Scotland. Hi, Douglas. Hi, how are you? Uh, very well, thank you. And also, you're famously a football referee, so we can ask you some World Cup questions later on. Um, but in the World Cup of whether Scotland gets to be an independent nation, when I mean, we're only in the heats of that, that argument at the moment, um, does this now mean there is basically no way Scotland could ever leave the Union without the permission of the government of Westminster? Is that what the Supreme Court ruling actually now fundamentally means? Well, look, I think what the Supreme Court ruling uh, shows is there was a very clear, unanimous uh, outcome of that case. The five justices all agreed uh, that the Constitution is reserved to the UK Parliament. That was always my view, and I think the view of the vast majority of legal experts, political experts uh, and others. And I'm just a bit disappointed that Nicola Sturgeon took this to court, dragged both of Scotland's governments into the courtroom to debate this at a cost of hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money, when I think most of us knew this was the outcome, this was the, the result. Uh, but sadly, you know, immediately after, although saying she respects the outcome of the court, uh, Nicola Sturgeon is now looking at how she can yet again circumvent that by making the next general election a, a de facto referendum for the SNP. And I think that's wrong as well, because... It's not for politicians to dictate to the public it, what they should be focused on or interested in in an election campaign. On that specific point, though, Douglas, that Adam puts to you, um, can you sort of take that on directly? Because the, the, the fundamental truth at the heart of well, what you're saying and what the Supreme Court was saying was that, yes, the power is reserved, it lies with Westminster, but that means for as long as Westminster, under any political complexion, says no, it doesn't really matter, does it, what... Scottish voters say in any kind of election on the whole question of independence because it won't happen. And, and hence that argument you hear from the First Minister that this is about democracy and, and that sense, that, as she sees it, of, of a democracy denied. Well, I think democracy is respecting the outcome of referendums. And it's just eight short years ago that we had a very long campaign here in Scotland to decide if Scotland should remain part of the United Kingdom uh, or be separated from the rest of the UK. And the people of Scotland, by a significant majority, uh, voted to remain. So we were told at the time that it would be respected by both sides, that uh, they would follow the outcome of that referendum and adhere to it. But since then, Nicola Sturgeon and the Nationalists have never accepted that result and have always tried to have uh, another referendum. We've mentioned Nicola Sturgeon a few times. Let's have a little listen to her in the Scottish Parliament. And uh, on the internet, this clip is called Nicola Sturgeon ridicules Douglas Ross. Let's see why. Let me uh, just reflect on the last few weeks in the life of Douglas Ross, leader, for now, of the Scottish Conservative <laughs> Party. He called on Boris Johnson to resign. Then he U-turned. Then he called on Boris Johnson to resign again. Then he U-turned again. He demanded that I follow uh, the mini-budget. Then he applauded Liz Trust for scrapping the mini-budget. He voted for fracking in England. Now I think he welcomes the fact that the fracking ban has been reinstated in England. Uh, just last week or the week before, he said that Liz Trust would win the next general election. And days later, he welcomed the resignation of Liz Trust. Today he backs Rishi Sunak. Who knows what Douglas Ross's position will be this time next week? Did Nicola Sturgeon get anything wrong in that list? Look, that was an answer that I, uh, to a question I posed about the NHS in Scotland, about people waiting hours and sometimes days for an ambulance to then take them to A&E, to sit outside, to not get a bed in A&E. And the number of emails I had from people about that saying, fine, Nicola Sturgeon makes her political point. She had that scripted by her spin doctors, of which we have now record numbers here in Scotland. But she couldn't even be bothered to answer the question about the health service. She would rather make cheap political attacks on an opponent mm -hmm. rather than get to the bottom of the issues that are affecting people day in, day out, right across Scotland in the health service that is fully devolved and fully under the remit of Nicola Sturgeon and her okay. SNP. I mean, of course, of course, Rishi Sunak, your leader, would of course never respond to a question from, say, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, by saying, ah, but you supported uh, Jeremy Corbyn a few years ago, which some people well, would say could be the equivalent. More, I mean, every, more everyone does that, not, don't they? When I've listened, more often than not, when I've listened to the Prime Minister, he tries to at least... Uh, answer the substantive question. Nicola Sturgeon simply doesn't. Right, let's talk about your, your other life outside politics where um, 
um, you're quite famous for having been a referee. Although it's interesting, a lot of the pictures of you in action are actually when you've been a linesman. So I don't want people complaining that I don't know the difference between a referee. a referee and a linesman. Um, when you're wa- when you're watching the World Cup, are you watching the football or are you actually secretly watching the refereeing? <laughs> Well, there's no secret at all. I am only watching uh, the referees. And indeed, there were some expletives in my office here in Holyrood uh, the other day when the commentator was criticising the assistant referee, which is the correct terminology, uh, for a late flag. But actually, the the timing was outstanding. Uh, There was a player just offside, uh, just over the halfway line, had a clear uh, opportunity to score. He did score, and then immediately the assistant referee put up the flag. And I thought it was great officiating and awful commentating and I made that clear to the whole floor here at Holyrood. Oh, well, that's the whistle being blown because I think we're at <laughs> more than half time in this episode of Newscast. But Douglas, thank you very much. Great. Good to join you. Right. Catch us back. Now, Catcher, you've been on quite, an, quite a dramatic deployment at sea. Tell us all about it. I had two sea deployments, actually, which is great. You know, my grandfather was in the Merchant Navy. So C was in his, but in fact, I love this, I love this. Uh, He ran away to C when he was 16 with his dog. I quite like that. Um, I didn't have a dog or anything, um, but I did go to the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. The reason we went to the Baltic Sea is, you may remember at the end of September, there were those uh, three explosions on two major gas pipelines which run uh, between Russia and Europe. And the gas pipelines weren't in use at the time. Um, But that act, which, you know, has widely uh, been called sabotage, uh, you know, there's a kind of a real whodunit about it. Mm. Uh, Western countries suspect Russia. Uh, Russia says it's the US. It specifically laid the blame actually on uh, the Royal Navy. Uh, The Royal Navy response was, you're only saying that Russia because you're trying to deflect from your own uh, military failings. But anyway, not very much is known about this site because it's, it's happened near the territorial waters of Sweden and Denmark. The pipeline makes landfall in Germany. So all those countries are doing their own investigation. Mm-hmm. The Russians have been carrying out their investigation as well, but they've not been sharing much of the intelligence. And okay. there are loads of conspiracy theories because, you know, there are those who say, you know, it, it, it wasn't Russia and it's just the West um, blaming them as well. So we went there to have a look for ourselves and send down some underwater drones. And after that, we went into the North Sea um, with the Norwegian Navy because uh, we are looking to Norway these days as the main supplier uh, of natural gas. Um, And Europe as a whole is looking to Norway very much, too, since it's been weaning itself off Russian energy. So Norway is trying to patrol all that underwater infrastructure. So all those pipelines, but something else, underwater infrastructure, all of the data cables that keep us all connected together and also trillions of pounds worth uh, of uh, financial transactions are carried out using those cables a day. And all of a sudden, it seems like NATO's woken up and gone, wow, they're pretty vulnerable, so so we better do something about it. Katja, thank you so much for all your daring do and thanks for coming back on to Newscast. Thank you. And have you seen this, Adam, that the Newscast team have found? Talk about a throwback. This is a This Week cake tin featuring, don't they look young? A young Andrew, Diane, and, 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 and Michael. Um, there we are. That's Thursday evening vintage telly before the new ca- newscast era. I wonder if there's a cake in there. Like, sort of like... So the sticky tape <laughs> that held cake. it together right. is pretty Do you know what? Open. My mouth is watering so much for this cake, so let's dive in. Happy it. 700th episode newscast. No, is the answer. <laughs> and thank you for watching and listening. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC.